My name is Fred Krause, um, along with my wife, Dora. She's in the back there. We've been members here for quite a number of years. I've served, obviously, on the worship team as I play the bass here. And uh, also, I've been privileged to um, serve on the uh, elder board and the elder team, really, um, for a few years. And it's just been a blessing that they've asked me to come and share with you today. And um, they asked me to share whatever, whatever was on my heart. And uh, they've been so unbelievably gracious to give me till 2 or 3 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> Um, because it's been a long time since I've been up here on Sunday. So uh, they've been really, no, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm kidding. Um, I know my appetite uh, wouldn't uh, hold out, and I'm sure yours wouldn't either. Um, Baptists really like our, our meals, and uh, that wouldn't go over too well. I know we get hungry for lunch, but um, before the power of suggestion gets the better of us. I, I want to remind us what Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 4.4. 4. He says, uh, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And of course, he was talking to Satan as he was being tempted in the wilderness. And it reminds us that, of course, we need food for our physical bodies. Uh, but uh oh, do we, there we go, it's back. We also need food for our spiritual well-being. And of course, his word is that, spoo, uh, that food, that manna that comes from heaven that we need to dine on spiritually. Starvation uh, of the body will lead to physical death, but starvation of God's truth will lead to spiritual death as well. In the world today, the appetite for truth seems to be diminished. Hey, I'm losing my mic here somehow. We, we all right back there, John? What's that? We're good now? Yeah, I feel, feel it cutting in and out. I don't know what's going on. Is it this thing? What is it? Help me. Right. Keep going, you're cute. <laughs> this is, Fred wants to tell a joke right now. Uh, let me think of one. That's, I got a while to go, yeah. I, hang in there, hang in there with me. But as I was saying, you know, the, if you look around, if you look out into the world, if you read anything in the news, you find that our world is losing its desire and its appetite for the truth. And it's, it's really um, extremely um, concerning. Uh, just as uh, hunger can uh, lead us to junk food, which isn't nourishing, uh, those that are still left looking for truth seem to be looking in all the wrong places, don't they? I know that we're hungry for food, but the question is, and this is the title of my message, are we hungry for the truth? And that's really important. That seems almost elementary. It almost seems like Christianity 101, but it's something that I don't know that we think about. I know I don't enough about, am I hungry for the truth of God's word? Am I hungry for him and the truth that he gives me? When we, again, when we look into the world, we see a, an epidemic of... Um, a lack of truth, if you will. And in a recent Barna poll, we find that almost six in 10 Americans believe moral truth is determined by the individual. And less than half who attend evangelical churches say that there is absolute moral truth. That's less than half of those that attend a church like this one say that there is absolute moral truth. That's very concerning. And of course, if we look into our young people, in particular, Generation Z, they did a survey between the ages of 13 and 18. Of course, that's, I guess, uh, middle school and high school these days. And that was even more alarming. One out of three said that lying was morally wrong. One out of four said abortion is morally wrong. And one out of three said that marriage between a man and a woman for life is, is acceptable and should be the, the, should be the norm. One in five says that sex before marriage is morally wrong. And one in five says homosexual behavior is morally wrong. 
And so obviously we have a dearth of truth that is out there just by some of these surveys that we see. And here's what really grieves me. The second leading cause of death amongst that group is suicide. It's clear that many in this generation are mired in godlessness, and that brings hopelessness. And when we go further than that and we look at all practicing Christians, only really 17% have a biblical worldview. In other words, they see the world through the lens of Scripture. Not only has specific truth that is found in God's Word been largely rejected, but truth in general is under assault today. And one of the reasons, one of the big reasons, is it's to be feared. Truth is really messy, isn't it? It can bring really good news, but it can also bring pain, and it can bring rejection. In the new way of thinking out there, truth is discovered by how we feel. It becomes subjective, open to opinion. You have your truth, and I have my truth. How can, how can you challenge that? So many feel that to push your truth on someone else is offensive. And some even believe that it should be illegal. We are seeing this kind of antichrist thinking showing up in even our school systems today. And it's particularly bad at the university level, the public university level, where our children seem to come home more indoctrinated than educated. The social powers that be are now demanding that the old way of thinking has to go. Even the church must accept the new standards of today, and unfortunately, many have. We have whole denominations that have abandoned the truth and allowed the culture to seep into their doctrine. It's really easy to be lulled asleep when we think the enemy is on foreign shores far, far away from us, right? But the fact is, the truth is, the reality is that he is in our neighborhoods. He's knocking at our doors. He's even getting into our sanctuaries. He's after us, our children and our grandchildren. And at the very least, he would like to neutralize us from being effective for God and his purposes. There was a time not long ago, I remember when I grew up, even though most probably were not what we would call born-again Christians in that day, the, the basic acceptance of society was really the word of God. And like I said, um, I'm not naive enough to think that most were believers back then, but there was a, a basic level of acceptance in the Judeo-Christian um, ethic. And that was then. Times have abruptly changed. And when we look at the war between Ukraine and Russia, we're so thankful that our own, our own boys and girls are not out there serving in an harm's way. But the reality is that we are in a war, all of us. And if our spiritual eyes are open, this war that is raging has always been rage, raging. Only now, for us, the enemy is on the attack with a major offensive. And we, as Christians, are really the only ones that can fight back. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul frames in our battle quite well here. And he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our enemy isn't those people that are speaking against our God or speaking against us, but they're against the powers of darkness that are behind that. I thank God, I, I just marvel at the slide that was up there, 40 Days of Life, and the fact that they emphasize prayer. That's the battleground, praying against the powers of darkness. Some people say, well, what's prayer going to do outside abortion clinic? Well, I'll tell you, it'll do plenty, because prayer can push back the powers of darkness. It's time that we embrace the truth, isn't it? And we engage in the battle if we're not in it already. But before we can do that, we need to come to some conclusions in our own minds 
and hearts. I go back to the scripture, Pontius Pilate, when he was dialoguing with Jesus, as Jesus was kind of up before him on trial, told Jesus, he said to Jesus, what is truth? And believe it or not, as, as, as Christians, we need to settle that in our minds and hearts. What is truth and where does it come from? Again, that sounds like Christianity 101, that everybody should know that, right? The problem is sometimes there's a disconnect from what we say, what we say we believe, and actually what we do. Losing it again, aren't I? I don't know what's going on there. Turn with me, if you would, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 45, and we're going to look at verses 18 and 19. It'll be up on the screen as well if you don't have your Bible. And Isaiah gives us the word of the Lord. He says, for this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret from a land somewhere, I'm sorry, uh, from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Can anyone say amen? amen? Praise the Lord. It's the Lord who is the author of truth. It's the Lord who is the source of truth. And that leads me to my first point. I only have two. <laughs> and that is we believe God is the source of all truth revealed through his holy scriptures. And again, you may, this may sound quite familiar to you, and I hope it does. But the fact is that do we really believe that? Jesus also clarified it and pointed to the truth when he was praying with his, or to his Father in heaven about his disciples. He said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And the fact is, is that every word that we see in this holy book is the truth. And it's up to us to stand on that truth. 2 Timothy 3.16 shares with us, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We are, as believers, privileged to have this truth before us. But if we're wondering why the world is stumbling along, having lost its way, watching it going off the rails, the fact is the world, the unbelieving world, cannot know God's truth. It has no access to the truth of God. I, I don't know if... You know, we've grasped that. It's taken me a number of years to fully grasp that because I scratch my head and I say, how can they believe that? How can they do that? But the fact is, is that an unbelieving world cannot seek God's word, cannot desire God, cannot seek God. Why do you say that? Why do I say that? Because Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, I think this verse was used not long ago in one of our messages, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. The fact here is that we are all, before we come to Christ, dead spiritually. The Bible teaches, as I mentioned just a second ago, we don't seek God on our own. We don't want to know him. We don't understand him. We don't know our purpose. We don't know where we're going because that's hidden from us. The curse has brought all these things upon us. And his truth is only revealed by faith by him. I love the verse in Matthew 16 where Jesus tells us how this process happens. Listen to how the dialogue between Jesus and his disciples, in particular Peter, 
in Matthew 16, 15, and 7 through 17. Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Jesus also tells us, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. The world cannot see the truth of God unless God reveals it to them. We've been, as believers, privileged to have the mysteries of God unlocked to, unlock to us. And the gospel that brought us to salvation, the good news of Jesus Christ that came to us that whenever it happened in your life, whether you were this big or whether you were grown up, I was in my late 20s when I came to know Christ, even though I'd gone to church all my life, was my window into the truth. I believe that simple thing that Jesus took my sins upon himself and died on that cross, and by trusting in him, and turning from those sins, I'll have everlasting life. But that is the beginning. That's the foundation, but it's the beginning. That occupies a lot of scripture, but there's so much more that God reveals to us in his word. And I'm so thankful that we're privileged to know those mysteries of God, but we cannot stop at the gospel, but we need to fill our minds with the truth of God's word, the whole truth. In Romans chapter 12, too, many of you know this one, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We are to gorge ourselves on the manna from heaven. If we're going to be any effect in the world, we have to fill ourselves with God's word and we have to believe it. We learn so much from it from the very beginning in Genesis. We learn that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and on the seventh he rested. There's been pressure uh, to infiltrate this incredible account of creation with evolution. And there's no hint in God's word that these days were any longer than a day. It says there was morning and evening on the first day of creation, and he repeats that every subsequent day. That God made all living things according to their kinds. God didn't create an amoeba and then it turned into something else. No, a lion that was created in that day is a lion that we have today. And it's simple. We don't have to read a lot into his word. He, he shares very clearly to us. He reveals in Genesis that man was made in the image of God. And in the New Testament, we were told that believers are all, in one, all one in Christ. There's a push for, for us to isolate everybody into their own groups today. Sometimes it's by race, sometimes it's by class. But the fact is, we are all made in the image of God. There's no room for racism, and there's no need to separate everyone according to different categories. We have been made in the image of God, and if you're a believer today, we are all one in Christ. He also told us that he created male and female, and each were given a gender before the foundation of the world. We're seeing a lot of confused people out there today. God did not make a mistake. He made me a male. He made my wife a female. And although human beings get confused from time to time, little ones get confused, which is totally normal. The fact is, and the truth is, there are two genders and two genders only because God says so. Jesus also affirmed the count of Genesis about marriage, that it's between one man and one woman, and that two become one flesh. And he says this is a profound mystery. Nobody can really explain that. But also that sexual relations are confined strictly to that covenant, period. There's no other provision anywhere 
in God's holy word for anything else. But obviously there's been pressure, certainly outside the church, but also inside the church to kind of change that and to eliminate that. We've also seen in God's word that he blesses his people when they trust and obey. But where God brings discipline on his people when they don't. Where God rained down fire and brimstone when man relentlessly pursued homosexuality and sexual depravity. We've been given the commandments, but they're to show us our sin. But the good news is that God doesn't leave us there, that he also shares with us that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. These are all things that we discover in God's word, and they begin to unfold like a flower before us. We believe that through repentance and faith, in Jesus Christ, that he gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit to help us to be sanctified, to live a life pleasing to God. We also see that God desires for us to know him. It's not just an intellectual endeavor with God's word, but it's knowing God. The foundation certainly is his word. Obviously, we're talking about that right now. But we need to know him. There are many that did works that they proclaimed to Jesus in his name. And he said, away from me, you evildoers. I never what? Do you know the rest? I never knew you. These are all things that we discover in his word. We also see that life begins when God decreed us to be, and therefore abortion is murder. It's that simple. We see that all lawlessness is an abomination to God. We also see all the miracles that he did in the Old and the New Testament and showed his, displayed his power. We're told to pray in his will and do not doubt. He also commands us to love one another and love our enemies, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, that we're ambassadors to bring him glory. And he, just as I mentioned a moment ago, he's given us his Holy Spirit to accomplish everything that he's asked of us. What I just mentioned and what I just went through barely scratches the surface of what we find in God's word. But the question is, do we believe it? Do we really believe what he says in his word? How important Is it that we know his word? Look at how he frames it in Deuteronomy chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 18 through 21. And of course, this is about the law that was given. We have so much more prophecies in in the Old Testament and the New Testament that was given us. But look at how important it is to the Lord. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach him, teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land that the Lord swore to give your forefathers, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth." God shares with us clearly, specifically, how important it is that we ingest, the, again, the manna that comes from heaven, his word. And James tells us that we need to do even more than that. James 1, and 24. Sorry, I'm bombarding you with all these scriptures, but I think it's really important. James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I I always love that picture. Can you imagine going in front of a mirror and looking at yourself and walking away and forgetting what you look like? What he's saying here is that do we go to a, a mirror and not pay attention? We go there for a purpose, maybe, it, maybe your purpose, maybe my purpose, because I'm so handsome and I want to just see myself. <laughs> maybe it's to see if my hair is combed, or maybe it's that little piece of broccoli that's left from lunch. 
But the fact is, it's a silly notion, isn't it? That we would forget what we look like. And it's the same thing when we go through this intellectual exercise of reading God's word, but it doesn't penetrate. But we don't take it serious, that we don't meditate on it, that we're not in prayer. Lord, what does this mean for me? What do you have for me with this? And how can I apply it? And that leads me to my second and final point. We're to live out God's word, I should say his truth, in words and actions. So often it's about what we do, and it is. That's so vitally important. But I want to focus on words and what we say because we are God's ambassadors. We're representative of him. And by speaking the truth to people, we're also being obedient. I want to focus particularly on Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, the Great Commission. You may have heard of it. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. We really have a maybe a, a tendency or we have the temptation to thrust this passage on our spiritual leaders, pastors or elders, evangelists, that sort of thing. But the fact is that as we're going to find out later on, even more clearly in just a moment, that that applies to all of us, that we're to make disciples whenever we come across anyone that we can have an audience with. And if you wonder what God wants you to do with your life, here's a general command for us all that we're to glorify God, not only by what we do, obviously incredibly important, but what we say and how we defend the kingdom of God and how we share the truth and sometimes how we stop people from thinking that what they've just professed to you is a good idea. No, that's, I don't agree with that. That's wrong and here's why. Because before we can come to salvation, sometimes we've got to come to the realization that we're a sinner, right? We can't possibly accept the Savior until we realize we need one. So it's very important that we get the opportunity that we share not only the gospel, but sometimes to enlighten people in the folly that they're headed in. And that's for all of us. I realize that Many of us are not called into in an office of ministry, but we are to be obedient to this command. We're seeing a wholesale rejection of God's truth outside and inside the church. And Isaiah reminds us of this and what we're seeing right now in the world outside. And he says in Isaiah 5, 20 and 21, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Folks, people are running down the road that leads to destruction. And God wants us to do something about it. What we described in Isaiah there uh, that passage that we just read was what we're seeing exactly to a T in the world. People are becoming gods in their own eyes. They're, they're making up truth. It's, it's fictitious. It's not real. And not only do they want to stay in that, that unhealthy environment that they've created, but they want you to go along with it and promote it. We can't have that. We can't allow that because that's to their destruction. We're to have the love of Christ. We're to look compassionate upon the world. And what the world needs, we have. It's called the truth. We have a light within us. Do we put a, light, a bowl over a light and suffocate it? No, we let it out. And it's so important that we do so. The great physicist Albert Einstein, I don't like using secular quotes, but I think this is so 
applicable today. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. And it's time that we do something. It's time that we, certainly it's time that we pray. It's time that we get on our knees and we go into a spiritual battle and ask the Lord to fight the powers of darkness that are trying to overthrow our children, our neighborhoods, and even sometimes our churches. And we have, every one of us, a ministry around us, don't we? If you're a parent, you have your children. That's your greatest responsibility, to train them up in the way they should go by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But we also have, many of us, grandchildren and other family members and friends and neighbors and coworkers, people we meet. If we really believe that we have the pill that will bring a cure to what ails the world, are we gonna keep it to ourselves? If you have the cure for cancer in a pill and you refuse to give it, what would that make us? And we have, we have the remedy. Now that doesn't mean that just because we get motivated and excited and begin sharing the truth, the, the world's gonna fall on its knees and begins praising God because you did that. No, there's quite a lot of rejection out there, but that's okay. We see that the apostles went through rejection, the disciples all the way through history, and much more than just verbal rejection. But I want us to consider three things as I wind down this message today. As you engage in the battle, three things that are vitally important. God doesn't leave us powerless. He doesn't leave us without tools in our belt to wage war on the powers of darkness and to, and to proclaim his truth in whatever form he has you use it that particular day and with that particular audience. And the very first thing is found in the book of Acts. The first two actually are in Acts chapter 1-8. And it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I know he wasn't talking to just his apostles there, although he was specifically talking to his disciples right at that point. But the Spirit of God came upon all who were present in the upper room that day. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead inside of you. And he will give you what you need to proclaim the truth. But we need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. The first thing we think about when we talk about being a witness or or sharing truth with people, we get afraid. Fear comes over us because we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid we don't have the right words or we're not learned enough. Well, if we're not learned enough, we can do something about that. But the fact is, is that the enemy is always going to propel fear at you. That's that's natural. I remember once Pastor Terry told me that I could never get up in front of a congregation and speak. That was many years ago. But he, I mean, he, he was to the point where he probably would have strangled me if I would have forced him up here. Just kidding. But he was that, he was that adamant about speaking in front of people. But God can do wonderful and miraculous things, can he? And so depend upon the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord to help you. Pray for those that he has put in your sphere of influence, particularly your children, your grandchildren. Pray that their hearts would be open and that that God would protect them from the enemy. Pray that Satan is moved out of the way because he'd like to snatch the truth. You can look at how that works. And when you look at the uh, parable of the, the soil, In the Gospels, Jesus dealt with the four types of soil. The enemy snatches away seed. Pray that that doesn't happen. The second thing I'd like you to consider is found in Acts chapter 4, 29 through 31. This is right after Peter and John had been released from prison. And they had been in prison for the very thing I'm talking about, for speaking the name of Jesus for proclaiming the truth. And they were released and they went to their brothers and sisters. And do you think that they prayed for safety at that point? 
Is that what they prayed for? No. In verse 29 of chapter 4 in Acts, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They prayed for even more boldness, even though they faced arrest. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miracles and signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. It says all of them. Now, I don't know if we pray for boldness here, and I'm going to have Matt come and pray, and I'm going to have him at the end of service pray because i got to play the bass again. But I'm going to have him pray for boldness, and I'm not sure that the Lord is going to shake this room. He could. But the fact is, is that that is a prayer that we see is answered. God is pleased with that. And if you need to be effective in your world with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ or whatever truth, whether it's stopping someone from thinking that what they're doing is good when it's evil, then he will give you the boldness to do it if you ask him. And pray that the Lord would speak through you. Ask him to give you the words. So often we, we get tongue-tied and we think, oh, I can't do this. You can do this. If you depend upon him, he will give you what you need at that particular time. And then the last thing I'd like you to consider before you enter into this battle is found in Romans chapter 1. And this might be one of the most powerful things of all here is that Paul tells us, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. I don't know what it is, but the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful. There's something in it that changes the hearts of individuals. Not, not everybody, but it's the only thing, the God's word through the Holy Spirit in the gospel that can change the heart of mankind. We have the remedy for a dying world. And again, will you face rejection? You betcha. I remember the first time I was privileged to share the full gospel with somebody that, that I had been talking to and, and, and uh, ministering to over a course of time. And they finally came to the point, how do, how, do I, how do I get right with God? How do I find salvation? And I was able to share that with them and then pray with them and then disciple them afterwards. And it was the most, listen, folks, you like golf? You like fishing? I like all that stuff. You know, you, whatever it is you do, there's nothing greater than that. There's nothing greater than ministering to someone with the strength of the Holy Spirit and watching a life change before your very eyes. There's nothing greater. You'll never have a greater joy in your life. And it's so important that we depend upon the fact that God does not leave us powerless, but that there's power in his word and in the gospel. Of course, in Hebrews, it tells us, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword for penetrating even the dividing of soul and spirit, spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. When we use God's word, the Holy Spirit does something with it. I don't understand it, folks, but it's true. And he's given us these tools the word of God can penetrate the heart. We have the answer to a dying world. We have the truth right here in our hearts and found in God's word. And he wants us to be about his business and spreading it. We need to be about the kingdom, no matter what the cost. It's so important that we disciple our children to stand on the Lord's truth. And we need to pray that our fears will be diminished, that we can overcome them, and that we depend upon the Lord with the tools that he's given us. Time is getting late, and there's a great need out there. And if you've come here today, and Matt, you can come on up if you like. You've come here today, and you don't know if you're right with God. I know this message has been mainly for the 
the, uh, the house of believers, the brothers and sisters in the Lord here. But if you've come and you're not sure that you're a Christian, you're not sure that you have eternal life, and maybe you're not sure if you're right with God, today can be your day. Today can be the day that you call on the Lord. You can do it anywhere. You can do it at home. You can do it right here. I urge you, if God is, 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 is pricking and touching your heart and you feel you're not right with him and you're not sure how to make that happen, there's a number of people around you, I'm sure, that will help you with that. See one of the elders. Where are the elders we got on hand? Raise your hand. There's one right here in the front. We got one right here. I don't know where Kay, Casey's in the back. Um, I'll be happy to talk. Anybody, any, any of these people will be happy to lead you in the right direction and get you on the right track to bring faith into your heart and to call upon the name of the Lord. It says that if we do that, we call on the name of the Lord, we'll never be put to shame. So let's go to him in prayer. Matt? Lord, we thank you so much for your scripture, God, your perfect word your truth. And God, we pray that you continue to drive us to be hungry uh, for your word, God. Lord, I know there are some of us that study a lot. And God, I pray that you would give us uh, obedience with what we know. And Lord, then there are some who are obedient, but we need to learn more. We need to be in your word more, God. I pray that you would challenge us all with these things. But God, I pray that as we read and study And as we become doers of your word, God, that you would just solidify that conviction, God, on who you are and what you have done. God, that you would continue to just uh, strengthen our resolve and that we are your children. God, so that we would stand for truth when it's extremely difficult. God, I know sometimes it's even just dealing with family or or friends or people that we have seemingly great relationships with, that it's the hardest time to say something about you and your stance for holiness. And God, I just pray that you would help us to be bold in those situations as well. God, I pray that our, our neighbors, our family, our friends, Lord, our coworkers, that they would all know where we stand, that we belong to you, that we're not a slave to our sin, but we are a slave to Christ. And God, we thank you for this gift. And we thank you so much for your truth. Again, Lord, please help us to be obedient and to be doers of your word. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen.